The sound. The sound of... The sound of Wiltshire. BBC Radio Wiltshire Breakfast. BBC Radio Wiltshire. But it's only 6.51, not even 7 o'clock yet, but Karen Gardner is ever out in her favourite county. It's English Tourism Week, and to mark it, we've been showing you just how much variety there is for visitors to our glorious county. And earlier this week, KG travelled to the very far southwest of Wiltshire to Mere to take in the sweeping landscapes and nature of the National Trust Stourhead. Today, we're in the north of Wiltshire and visiting one of her other favourite places in the county, an urban attraction which showcases the history of digital development. It's the Museum of Computing in Swindon, and I'm guessing you're a, a Spectrum 16K kind of girl, Karen. Good morning. I think it's very presumptuous of you. I mean, I could be somebody who is one of these. You know that is? That's the sound of an abacus, which is, after <laughs> all, where computing started. <laughs> Not Imagine if I'd spare. said that. Imagine if I'd said that. Of course, it's just as well you yeah. said that and not me saying that. Yeah. And I have broken out into a cold sweat this morning because there's some slide rules in front of me. And honestly, work of the devil, black art those. I had to do them for O-level and I still have nightmares about them. This place is amazing. I mean, I've been coming here on and off for years. Uh, present Mr Gardner's favourite place in the county, I have to say. Uh uh, and now it's reached a new zenith. It has been spruced up, tidied up, shiny display cases, lots of information and masses of history for all of us. I stand in this room and I can see my own history, of course, the Sinclair, um, and it does say the ZX81, and actually I think that was a little bit ahead of me, I'm not sure. Uh, and there are PlayStations, and there are Apple computers, and there there are research machine computers, that'll take people back. Uh, it all beautifully laid out, lots of it hands-on, really, really good fun, virtually run on a shoestring, you could barely buy a charging cable for an iPhone with the budget this place has. Volunteers make all the difference, uh, and it's a real colossus actually in terms of the value it delivers to visitors so we've got to unpack that a bit today and um there's also one of those sinclair c5 scootery things Go i on, might yet sit get in, in that it. yeah <laughs> <laughs> photos please photos your lovely photo taking skills to the fore if you have a little zoom around in that or at least get in it uh two things karen thank you for reminding me that yeah. i need to order even more iphone cables later on because the kids keep breaking mine um, so I'll do that. And secondly, you use the word, and I don't know if it's on purpose or not, zenith. And we are asking people today to show off a bit and tell us what they've climbed to the top of. The sound. The sound of... The sound of Wiltshire. BBC Radio Wiltshire Breakfast. BBC Radio Wiltshire. Right, it is English Tourism Week, and to mark it, we are showing you, and we have been this week, just how much variety there is for visitors to enjoy in our glorious county. Earlier this week, Karen Gardner travelled to the very far south west of Wiltshire to Mere to take in the sweeping landscapes and nature of the National Trust Stourhead, which is one of her undoubted favourite places in the county. Today, she's at another one in the north of Wiltshire, visiting an urban attraction, let me tell you, which showcases the history of our digital development, and that is the Museum of Computing in Swindon. Have you got your PS4 out there, Karen? Good morning. <laughs> I'm, honestly, this, this very small but perfectly formed museum is a journey through my childhood, uh, well, my grandparents' childhood and my children's childhood, and it's an emotionally very rewarding place to come. You can stand in Stourhead and, and feel your emotions and soul-fed by the views, but you can come to a place like this and step back into time and uh, you just look around and think, oh, I knew that, only that. I'm particularly entranced by um, the Apple stuff. Even though we're an Apple-free household, I was so jealous of the people who had Apple computers. So let's talk to Jeremy Holt, founder of this shiny electronic um, museum. Jeremy, how long have you been open? We have been open 21 years. We had our 20th anniversary party last year. And you, you know, when I came here, I'm guessing over 10 years ago, 
it was great, but it was it was a pile of things. You had so many donations, and you were so good at finding um, things to display. Now you've really, really nailed how to present them. What is the joy for you when visitors come through the door? I've got two children, but sometimes I stand outside the museum and just look at it and wonder, because for 13 years I tried to get this museum off the ground. So it means an awful lot to me to be outside the museum and to see that it exists and that it's been going for 21 years. So uh, uh, there's a great deal of my own personality embedded in the museum. Now you're an IT lawyer. Uh, at, why did you choose Swindon? Um, I came down here, like, like a third of the people here in Swindon, I came here from London to open a branch office of the law firm that I was working for at that time. And it didn't take me very long to realize that Swindon was an absolute hotbed of IT activity and I thought this town needs a few landmarks why don't we open a, why don't we open the country's first specialist computer museum here and after a bit of a struggle and a bit of a certain amount of patience uh, after 13 years we were able to get it off the ground I think considerable stamina was shown do you have a favorite thing here and, and I didn't warn you of that question <clears throat> absolutely and it's right behind you here this is a Curta calculator, a Curta calculator from 1948. And it's not because of the mechanism of the item itself, it's because of the history of it. Because the man who invented this invented it whilst he was in a concentration camp and he believed that he was going to survive and this gave him a reason for surviving wow. and after the war he developed this machine so it's the history of the Curta calculator I think we have two and we're we're very pleased to have those I mean, it's a little drum shaped thing looks a bit like a desktop pencil sharpener but it's an, and and in this display cabinet you have all sorts of calculators one of which is very like one I had for O-Level and makes me feel slightly sweaty and unwell. I, th I think the fact that your reference to O-Level gives away <laughs> your age, young lady. Oh, I've given young up on that. Young lady. I think they're called GCSEs now. And they were uh, called school certificate before they were called O-Levels. But it's interesting, isn't it? Because you start with the abacus and you've got very old-fashioned adding machines. You've got slide rules, another thing that makes me break out in a cold sweat. And actually, they are all computers. Oh, absolutely. These are by the door here, so people see them as they... They first come in and it's to show youngsters you know who've always brought been brought up in an internet area era and who've used computers from the time when they could first read or write that there was a time when we didn't have computers we didn't even have pocket calculators and therefore we we needed to use mechanical calculators or manual calculators to add things up or to divide them. Great fun. Let's just walk round past these very shiny display cabinets, all so beautifully done. And we're going to talk to Keith Mortimer, who's, a, who's um, the curator volunteer here. Keith, uh, you had a bit of luck and got hold of some great display cabinets because of COVID. Hmm. It's been a work, you know, to get this all organised, though, to get it looking so beautiful. Yes, yeah, so, uh, volunteers like myself are the lifeblood of places like this. And, and by putting in hours and hours of our own time passionately to create something you know great things can happen what's your favorite thing here I have two favorites I have the ZX81 which was my start in computing <laughs> yes mine too uh, and I you know, remember my father bringing it uh, a second-hand one home from work from a mate he bought it from and that started my journey with computers uh, and then in the 90s area area we've got uh, the Amiga range of computers which I was uh, probably the last computer I was really passionate about Brilliant. Well, we're going to look in a bit more detail at some of the exhibits here, Ben, today. Uh, and I'm going to step very far back into memory lane. Yeah. But I have to say the great joy of this is also interactive. And in front of me, I've got a row of machines. Go on, have a go. Uh, all with screens and everything. Yeah. All on. All uh, working. Your man there, an Amiga fan, you can tell him I was an Atari ST kind of boy. They were the two vying for people's attentions. And also, talking about calculators with your other guest... Um, can you ask, when we join you again later, if they've got a Texas Little Professor calculator? Because they were all the rage in the 80s. It was a picture of a, like a bearded professor on the front of the calculator with these orange and yellow keys. It was epic. Um, so I will inquire. Brilliant. That's fantastic. And, and, uh, and we'll go back to Karen later. I'm loving these bits today. So nostalgic. 
Uh, and what a story and these little side stories of people who invented these things. Incredible minds. The sound. The sound of... The sound of Wiltshire. BBC Radio Wiltshire Breakfast. BBC Radio Wiltshire. Now, it's English Tourism Week, and to market, we are showing you just how much variety there is out there for visitors to enjoy in our glorious county. And this morning, it's all about your Sonic the Hedgehogs on your game gears. It's about your Horace Go skiings on your Spectrum 48Ks and your Granny's Garden on the BBC computer that the teacher used to roll out in the mid-80s in my classroom in Seamills in Bristol. Glorious computing moments. Karen Gardner is at the Museum of Computing in Swindon. KG, what are you pressing now? Well, I think I must be psychic because I'm standing in front of an Acorn BC Micro 1981 vintage. Get your granny's garden on. Go on. Chucky Eggs, it shows. Chucky Egg. Uh, uh, Chucky Egg. Do you remember Chucky Egg? Oh, you're doing this to me now. You're really floating my computer boat. Chucky Egg. I was great at Chucky Egg, Karen. Oh, well, you're going to have to tell me how to play it. And and the great thing about this fabulous museum, just round the corner from the Wyvern Theatre, is that it's a hands-on museum, and you can hear in the background all the little chuntering going on of all these games ready for people to give them a try. They have a lot of children here. I've just learned about a scout group who've been doing their computing badge. We'll talk about that in a minute as well. But let's just unpick how it all started with Jeremy Holt, who was the founder. Uh, 21 years old, but you conceived this more than 30 years ago. Yes, I came here from London in 1985. I realised what a hotbed of IT activity Swindon was. If you looked in the back of the advertiser, any kind of computer equipment sold very quickly. Uh, we had people like Intel and the British Computer Society here. And, you know, the town needed a few things to be known for. And I thought it would be a good idea to set up the country's first specialist computer museum. I had a friend called Simon Webb, and we, he and I worked on this project together. I wrote to all the local IT companies saying what we were pr trying to do, and half of them wrote back and said that they would support what we were up to. And then 13 years later, we managed to get a, a museum off the ground. Now, I've had a little look downstairs at your storeroom, and that's only part of the uh, 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 <laughs> items you've got squirreled yeah. away in your garage and elsewhere. Yeah, you've that, got... <laughs> that's meant to be secret, but don't worry. <laughs> OK, all right. Well, I you... don't live anywhere, sorry. <laughs> you have so much, so many items, from abacuses and calculators right through to fairly modern laptops. Uh, it... How do you choose what to put on display? It is an issue because it, we're offered a lot of stuff and if it's small, we're more likely to say yes. The original idea that I had for the museum uh, is if we only had a small amount of space, I was going to do a display of pocket calculators because I thought they would be easy to store. So we haven't got any mainframes here because we just haven't got the space to be able to do it. And space is a big requirement. So if anyone's able to offer us any storage space in or around the Swindon area, we are very, very interested. Interested. You don't want to lose anything. Now, I asked you what your favourite item was, and very surprisingly, what you came up with was a cardboard box. It is, because computers have to come in a box, and we don't throw the boxes away, and on the top of the cabinets here, we have a display of the boxes that uh, the computers came in originally. Now, some of them look very sort of um, car booty, but there's one of the Sinclair QL that came out in 1985. And if you look at the typeface of the Sinclair QL, the QL stood for Quantum Leap. If you look at the colour of the box, you could sell a computer in that now. Oh, and yet could, it was it yeah. was almost 40 years ago. You could, you could certainly pick it up and take it home. Let's ask Keith Mortimer, volunteer and curator here, uh, Ben mentioned the uh, BBC school computers and you picked that out as your item. I did uh, because when I started in primary school uh, this was the computer we had on a trolley there's one for the whole school with a monitor and a keyboard and that was wheeled around on a little trolley and that's uh, for a lot of people my age that was their first uh, exposure to computers. And it was really important because it opened the eyes of a generation to the fact that this would be what we would do at work. It did. I mean, this is one of Margaret Thatcher's legacies in that pushing that uh, agenda to teach uh, the new workforce of the future all about computers. And these were probably used for too long in schools? 
Well, I mean, obviously schools, you know, they, they've got to uh, keep their devices and get the most out of them. But like with a lot of things, things shuffled down. So I suspect things lasted a lot longer in some schools than they should have. But you're very proud to hear it. Ben, it says here about oh, Chucky yeah. Egg, and oh. I have to say... Hen house, Henry. I, uh, we didn't have a computer in my school. I left before we could make up such things. Hen house, Harry... Hen House Harry must climb ladders and jump between platforms to collect the eggs before the time runs out or he's eaten by a hen. That sounds a bit cruel to me. What was your <laughs> highest score? Do you remember? Oh, uh, five higher than yours. <laughs> <laughs> well, I never played it, so that was easy, wasn't it? I, um, it, it I, you... Honestly... It's time you came back here. I oh, know I you've been it's, here once or twice, but you it really is. do. It's it's really leapt up uh, a, a considerable amount in, in terms of the standard display. It's fabulous, Ben. I've loved you talking about your Chucky eggs. Can you ask the guests for the next time we join you about their Jet Set Willies, please, if you can? That'd be brilliant. Jet Set and, Willies. And also, I have found out about the uh, Little Professor Texas calculator or yes, whatever. You, Karen, I wrote you, it down, you, and we will, <laughs> we will <you>. unpack that <laughs> later. <laughs> Hopefully your Spectrum 48K worked better than me and Karen just did then. The sound. The sound of... The sound of Wiltshire. BBC Radio Wiltshire Breakfast. BBC Radio Wiltshire. But now I must move on and play a bit of Chucky Egg. Here I am, look. Hen House Harry. Catching all my eggs. It's English Tourism Week and to market... We've been all over the county, and today we are at the Computing Museum in Swindon with Karen Gardner. And she was the one who mentioned Chucky Egg earlier on, because I mentioned the BBC computers that teachers like Mr Wynn, when I was eight years old, used to swing through the door on its little trolley, Karen, and we would all gleefully say, Mr Wynn, can we play Chucky Egg or Granny's Garden? And they've got a version of Chucky's Egg where you have, haven't they? They have, uh, and it was very popular. I've had a couple of messages from people to say, oh, my goodness, I've forgotten all about it. We've moved on in the Swindon Museum of Computing to the gaming area, which does nothing for me because I've never been into gaming uh, at all. And Keith and Jeremy, who are showing me around today, are a little disappointed in my lack of enthusiasm. Um, but, you know, I recognise the quality of the screens and the longevity of some of these games. And I also, when I see a Game Boy in colour, it makes me flinch because of just how much money I've spent on things like that for my children over the last few years. But this is a real hands-on period um, and let's talk to Keith Mortimer who's the volunteer curator here what's the most popular of these then well when the children come in obviously they will first gravitate towards things like the playstations and that that they recognize but um, things like the early uh, Binatone and the early Pong games that really show where gaming started are very popular because they they can play that with their parents and and and, and really get a, a, an idea of where gaming starts. Little black and white screen with slidey up and down bats, a uh, bright orange console with little um, joysticks. Uh, <laughs> simple, probably quite in inexpensive at the time. Well, relatively inexpensive, but um, I mean the massive growth of these type of things there was a chip that was sold that all these manufacturers could get into making a games console and selling them in department stores uh, and we're talking you know there weren't dedicated computer stores that back then these were sold in department stores uh, for the family to buy and my first gaming experience was with one of these type of machines uh, and, and they're just so fun still you're bearing up very well for someone who spent <laughs> far too much ga gaming Lex to Jeremy Holt founder conceiver IT lawyer originally so you got involved in some of this stuff down in the weeds quite early. I did. I, um, I shared a house with a number of people who worked in the IT industry when I first went to London. And so I read the magazines that they had. And I can remember working on a, a case involving computers at work. And at the end, I thought, gosh, that was, that was really very interesting. So I, I, I love following what's going on in the IT industry. So it was the IT industry that, Im that interested me rather than the nuts and bolts of the computer itself. And then word went out that there was some mad lawyer who was interested in computers and clients fell through the door. Uh, and, they, and now, 
having conceived and eventually 21 years establishing this we've got you know beautiful class ca glass cases revolving here with um, right from very very early on rather battered looking plastic games consoles right up to, to, to things that people would have treasured just a few years ago it it moves on. How do you keep up? Because every, you know, everything's go obsolete so quickly. You've got a new tranche of potential exhibits every two years. You're right. We d <clears throat> we have to be quite careful about what we take. It's really Keith's job to decide what we take. But we do have sort of anguished discussions sometime about what will people be interested in in 50 years' time after we've all, all been and gone? What will they be interested in? Because there may well be things that were that we don't regard as being particularly important but yet will be of very great interest to them because we no longer do it that way or because something terrible happened later on. So it, it's an interesting question if you're running a museum, what do you decide to keep and how many of those? We aim to have at least two working examples of any home computer that there's ever been. That's our co uh, collection policy. No wonder you're looking for more storage space. Um, Keith, you could do with another bit of help, which is a bit of help with education here. Yes, it, uh, in the museum we've also got a small educational area where we can we have a range of laptops and we can teach uh, usually scratch coding and things like that. Uh, and at the moment, one of our volunteers has had to take a step back for personal reasons. So we would love uh, if there's out there somebody who is passionate about educating the new generation of coders to come in and help us run our uh, educational facility here. Well, there you are. So you can find the museum on the web. Uh, and I have sent you a photograph, Ben, of your little professor calculator. You haven't. You haven't. But via which I medium? Have. Look at your email. Which conduit? Look at your email. Me email. I'll check my email. email. Okay, hang on a second. Check Let's see if this email. works. Hang on a minute. Karen Gardner. Here we go. Photo. There he is. The little professor. Orange and yellow calculator. It almost looks like an owl with a big bushy white beard and glasses on. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And that was all the rage. I remember seeing one in the Science Museum, actually, and they were pleased with that. And it's good to know that you've got one there as well, KG. Mission accomplished. Well, what you have to remember... What you have to remember is this was the first computing museum and therefore every other one is an imitator and you can argue that out between Apple well, and Android and Microsoft all you want. I couldn't disagree and your guests will like this because I'm going to read it to you now so you can pass it on if they're still listening. And it comes from Nikki who says, I've loved all the bits from Karen at the Swinning Computer Museum, Ben. I remember taking my young charges there about nine years ago when they were probably about five and seven who at the time they were screen mad and I was trying to wean them off of it. They couldn't believe how retro the 80s and 90s gadgets were. They got to play on Donkey Kong and Pac-Man and look at the computers that we used to use, like your Spectrums and your Dragons. And of course, <laughs> the first computer home game that used to play on TV, wait for it, the tennis game. Oh yeah, the yes. tennis game. They're lovely people who run it and we should absolutely thank them for what they've done. So that's nice from Nikki. Great. I will pass that on. Karen, thank you for that. 8.27. I'm, I don't get too nostalgic about things. I, I try to be a kind of like, look at what's in front of you rather than behind most of the time. But all this today with Chucky Egg and Granny's Garden and, you know, your Pac-Mans and your Donkey Kongs and all that, it's really getting to me. There's a great Twitter account, or X, and I forget its name, but it's basically... Um, a succession of old computer games, the actual sort of cassette boxes or, or floppy disks, and computer magazine front covers from, you know, the 80s through the 90s to the early 2000s. And whenever they ping up on my timeline, I'm like, oh, I have that one, I bought that one, you know? I, I reserved that one at the newsagent when you used to reserve magazines at the newsagent on the weekend. I mean, what, what, what was going on? The sound. The sound of... The sound of Wiltshire. BBC Radio Wiltshire Breakfast. BBC Radio Wiltshire.